Hello, welcome back um, <laughs> to like all five people that regularly watch my videos. Thanks. Uh, sorry for the delay and, you know, just missing last week entirely. Um, oh boy, I'm not streaming the right album at all. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, sorry for missing the last week entirely. It's just been challenging. <laughs> Uh, work has taken over my life in a not healthy way, and I'm working on fixing that. Uh, so in the meantime, I put up some acoustic paneling, and I've rearranged my, uh, you know, space. I'm going to see if it has any different effect on the voice quality as I read. So it'll be interesting to listen in and see if there are any changes. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to try and upload some stuff to ACX and see if I can get some freelance work narrating. Um, so, you know, if you guys got any tips or feedback, uh, feel free to email me. <laughs> and uh, check out my YouTube where I'll be uploading all of Venus Underground. Currently, one through three or four are up, I believe. Um, I've also got Leanne the Wayfarer up there, and um, the Moon Moth is uploaded there as well. Uh, but yeah, let's get back down to business. We're getting close to the end here. Now let me see. Ah, yes. Last time, um, Shadrach, Quinn, and the Gallics arrived at this Leviathan fish that's rotting but feels no pain. Uh, meerkats are warring against other creatures on the, in the fish, which serves as a sort of living city. It's, it's massive, and they're scientific experiments happening within its jaws there's buildings built up within the mouth um and it's just in a state of complete disarray and that's where we left off let's get back to biz before they could reach the floor of the mouth and from there the forest they chanced upon a hundred candles the path veered sharply down and to the right, sidestepping one of the Leviathan's teeth, which had fallen from the gums probably many years ago. When it leveled out again, the forest was directly ahead of them. To either side, more crucifixes, this time uniformly hammered to them a hundred creatures that looked just like candle, more than half-wolf or coyote, the elongation of the face revealed as muzzle, the eyes yellow and ancient, the legs ended in half paws, half feet. The tails were crusted in blood and hung limply down. Like vultures in their stance, but unnaturally so, the long arms and legs a burden to them. Behind them, the corona of fires amongst the buildings. There was none of the moaning that had marked the other crucifixions. They made no sound at all. Nuts and bolts held them to the posts. There was no way to bring any of them down. Candle, Shadrach shouted as they walked down the path. Candle, is one of you Candle? The one nearest to him raised its head, blinked through its blood in its eyes, pardon, through the blood in its eyes, but said nothing. Why was this done to you? Shadrach asked, while the Gallic skittered around impatiently and muttered under its breath. They always do this to traitors. It will be done to you, whispered John the Baptist. The meerkat whimpered, opened, and closed its mouth. The creature lowered its head as much as it was able, so it could look at Shadrach. I am a priest of the Church of Quinn. Quinn no longer wants priests for his church. I can help you down. I can... I'm dying. Kill me or leave me. That is all. But Shadrach could not kill this candle surrogate. He knew that if he killed this creature now, he would come all undone, would be worthless when he faced Quinn. So, he heeded the Gallics' pleading and continued down the path, promising himself... What? Nothing, really. He couldn't make such promises. His only allegiance was to the idea of the death of Quinn, the life of Nicola. When they reached the path of white pebbles that descended into the valley of dark fir trees, when he heard the sound of running water and saw the small bridge of red and white half hidden by the trees, when he smelled the thickness of the fir trees, then he realized he had seen the forest in Nicola's head, in her mind. 
and he wondered whether there really was such a place above level. What if he had entered a series of dreams in her mind, of things that actually happened, but that were distorted, unsound, mirror images? For a moment, this thought disoriented him. Didn't it mean she might love him after all? But the pebbles beneath his feet were real enough, and they scrunched against the Gallics' feet, too. Over the bridge they went, where the fiddler crabs stalked red and black butterflies. Just beyond stood a cottage with white walls and a thatched roof. Birds had built nests from the thatch, oblivious to Quinn's workings. Or had Quinn made them, too? Is this it? Yes, John the Baptist said, surprising Shadrach. This is the place. Do not enter. He looked into Shadrach's eyes. You will not come out. What is your real name? Shadrach said. It suddenly seemed important after all they had endured together. Not John, not Affliction, not Salvador. What is it? The meerkat, the meerkat coughed blood, its tongue pale, and said a word that sounded like the chattering speech of beetles. That is my name. My real name. It's nothing you could ever actually say yourself. It's nothing a human could ever say. You're right, Shadrach said. He turned toward the Gallics and asked, Is this the place? Yes, the Gallics said. Then lead the way. Inside, Shadrach found a long, empty corridor lined with blank glass cages, occupied only by dust. And, at the corridor's end, another remote of Quinn, its sad, oriental face swaying on too long a neck. The glass cages embedded in its sallow flesh had been covered by a black panel. Surprised and unnerved by the emptiness, Shadrach kept close to the Gallics as they walked toward the Quinn remote. He flipped the safety on his gun. The stillness of the empty room was more horrible than if it had been occupied by a hundred monstrosities. The Quinn remote leered and bobbed at them. When they stood before the remote, it said, I am Quinn. What do you want with me? The Gallics said nothing. Shadrach said, You're not Quinn. You're a remote. A construct. He raised his gun and shot the construct through the head. The head flopped over its counter. A spackle of blood glittered on the wall behind it. It shivered. It shuddered. It slowly righted itself and rose again. No, it said, staring at him with a smile as its head gushed blood. This is not me. The compartment in front of the facade slid open and there... On a small, reclining chair lay a puddle of pale flesh and scar tissue. Somewhere in the mass of perpetual double chins, the wriggly, maggot-like flesh, a dozen intense blue eyes shone out from jellied orbits. A lyrical laugh issued forth from some orifice hidden from Shadrach. Like all creative beings, Quinn, when compared to his work, failed to measure up. Shadrach felt as if he had just met a cretin who happened to be a brilliant Hollowvid artist. If the situation had not been so tense, it would have been hilarious. He would have laughed out loud, this horror, this horrid gobbit of flesh, when he had expected a giant. Surprised? The Quinn remote asked. Just a little bit? Shadrach lied. What did you expect? A great head? A lovely lady? A terrible beast, a ball of fire. None of the above. I'm just surprised that you seem more amorphous in the flesh than as an idea. Chadrach thought he read disappointment in the glob of flesh that was Quinn. Here and there, where the flesh was not translucent, Shadrach could see a nascent leg, an unborn arm. Were you always this way? Chadrach asked. He felt no sense of urgency now that he had finally found Quinn, simply a bone-aching fatigue and a need for answers. Not always. I was much more human. Once. What happened to you? The flesh formed a grim smile. 
but the eyes danced in the body. There is a point beyond which the human body cannot recover. I have passed that point. I have experimented on myself for too long, and I have put too much of my own tissue into my creations. You don't see surprised. You don't seem surprised to see me. Can you see the gun I'm aiming at you? Why should I be surprised? I've expected you or someone like you for a long time. I've made enemies, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. You just happen to be among the first to possess the combination of tenacity and insanity needed to find me. I assume you mean to kill me. By all means, kill me. It makes no difference. I've done what needs doing. There is no stopping it now. Do you mean the war going on outside? No, no, no. Periodically, I set them upon each other. The ones who survive breed, creating an ever stronger strain. This time, though, it seems somewhat more permanent. Was it a game when you altered Nicholas and had Nicola taken for parts? I'm not familiar with the names. I've done something to them, obviously, and you mean to seek revenge. Please take your revenge. But I don't know what you're talking about. My empire is vast and a sprawling thing. I cannot keep track of every misfit, every transaction. It's buried somewhere in the records, I'm sure. I might have played with a human named Nicholas. I might not have. Besides, how do you know I didn't create them both? If so, wouldn't you say I have the right to do with them, as I please? I can see from the look on your face that they were born in a vat. I was the city's birth engineer for a very long time. I may well have created them, you know. Certainly, if so, I would be the one to take care of them, to nurture them. Listen to your creator, Gallix, and kill this man now. It almost caught Shadrach off guard. The Gallix, which also seemed surprised, leapt at Shadrach, but Shadrach turned in time to cut its legs out from under it. The Gallix, the Gallix said as it writhed on the ground, is not designed specifically for combat. The Gallix is not designed for non-quadrupedal locomotion. Shadrach fried its brains out the back of its neck stump before aiming the gun once more at Quinn. A pity, Quinn said. He was a good and true Gallix. He tried to obey me. He tried to kill you. He may not even have wanted to do it. It was worth a try. I think I even surprised myself by doing that. I must want to live after all. You know, it's amazing how relaxed we humans become if you just drone on and on about nothing in particular. Why? Shadrach asked. Why what? Why am I a puddle of flesh? Why did I become a bioneer? Why what? You must be more specific. You cut up my lover and sold her for parts. You sent me to Lady Ellington's estate just so I would know it. Shadrach's shout reverberated around the room. The Quinn remote smiled while the eyes of the failing flesh beneath watched him intently. Maybe it was pleasurable, Shadrach. Maybe it was an interesting thing to do at the time. Maybe I don't have the slightest idea what you are talking about. Do you honestly think that I have any reason to tell you anything? Funny how easily humans lose control. My meerkats don't lose control. My meerkats make you humans look psychotic and frivolous at the same time. Perhaps I made them both, Nicola and Nicholas. Perhaps I deliberately didn't give Nicholas enough talent. So he'd have to come to me. Perhaps I watched Nicola all the years of her life until she delivered unto me, at the right time, an unpredictable element, you. All so you would come down here and kill me. Wouldn't that be the most spectacular genetic experiment ever? To have that subtle a control, to know that much, I don't believe I have it in me. Perhaps none of this actually happened, and by dumb luck and persistence you reached this point entirely by your own. Shut up, Shadrach said. I don't believe you. 
You know who Nicholas was. You know who Nicola is. You can shut me up permanently by killing me, Shadrach. You can do that. But I might be lying about everything. You'd never know. I might be the biggest liar the world has ever seen. You're caught between the desire to kill and the desire to know why. What if you could have both? The first might be enough. Ah, so you are interested. Then let's begin again. What do you want to know? What is your plan? What is it you hope to accomplish with... Shadrach gestured at their surroundings. All of this. Plans. Planning. At first I had no plan. At first the plan was to have no plan. But that got boring, and as I came to hate humans more and more, a plan came to me. I thought to myself, the human race is obsolete. Why not make a new one? Or maybe not. Maybe I'm just crazy. Let's assume you have a plan. What is it? Why should I tell you? I'll tell you why. Because it can't be stopped, that's why. The humans who live above ground haven't even thought about the implications of those toys I've made for them. They're too busy using them for prestige and to make their lives easier. They never stop to think what it all means. They could never believe in a giant fish that holds a whole world. They'd laugh. They'd scoff. Even if they saw it, they wouldn't believe it. That is why the human race is dying. Too limited an imagination. No thought for the consequences. Arrogance, Shadrach said. You are dying. No, the human race is dying. It's had its time, and yet has done nothing but squander it, each age a fainter echo of the last. Enough, I say. Be done, I say. Let some other species have its turn. You're crazy. The world will be a better place with you dead. I happen to agree with you, Shadrach. My creations need a martyr. They need a god who art in heaven. They need a myth of human intervention to make them whole. There is only so much you can breed into them, only so much you can do with their genes. Look at me, I know. The rest is environment, the rest is religion. If you kill me, the slow unraveling of the human race begins, for this death will be the first sign, the first symbol from which all the others derive, until one day the humans find their servants have become their masters. And if you don't kill me, be assured, I will erase all trace of you and your beloved from this city. I will find Nicola, assuming I don't already know where she is, and I will kill her. I think this is a great test for you as a human being. Will you buy more time for the human race by not killing me? Or will you buy more time for a single individual? I'm fascinated to see what you choose. What would Nicola think? if you saved her life, but sacrificed the species. Assuming you are telling the truth, assuming that if you tell the truth, your predictions are accurate, the pressure in Shadrach's head had grown intense. He felt as if he'd been listening to a hypnotist. And think of this. If I've truly programmed Nicola, then even if you kill me and return to the surface, could you ever really trust her again? Wouldn't you always be waiting for her to betray you? What are you doing? You'll see. Shadrach had set his gun for a two-inch laser beam. He began to burn a hole in the glass that housed Quinn. Ice water coursed through his veins. He had decided on a plan of action. No further thought was necessary. Kidnapping me won't help you. Those creatures out there will tear you limb from limb. He was almost finished cutting the circle. If you're going to kill me, this seems a very awkward way to do it. The circle fell out and shattered against the floor. The Quinn remote took a swipe at him from above, while Quinn himself cowered in a corner. I've changed my mind. I don't want to die. Not just yet. Perhaps we can reach some kind of arrangement. 
Shadrach adjusted the beam once again, severed the remote's neck so its head flopped impotently on the counter. So much for Quinn's voice. Then he snatched Quinn from his sanctuary, placed him on the countertop, and proceeded to beat him with the butt of the gun until the weapon was slick with blood. From his arm, John the Baptist shuddered uncontrollably at the sight. I wish I'd died in the closet, he said over and over. Quinn said nothing at all. Quinn was dead. Shadrach pulled the meerkat off of his arm. He flicked the switch on the bomb in the meerkat's ear. He placed the head next to Quinn. Goodbye, John, he said. I'm sorry. Your kind may take over the world, but it won't be easy. It won't happen in my lifetime. It might never happen. As he ran for the door, before the explosion propelled him forward and out into the forest, burning his back, he thought he heard one last muttered curse from the meerkat. Okay. Got ten pages left in this book. <laughs> now I'm trying to decide. Okay. I'll read uh, the first few pages of chapter nine and then we'll finish the book tomorrow. Either that, actually, maybe I should just leave chapter nine for tomorrow and we can finish it then. Um, give me a sec. I'm going to think it over. Ah, heck, let's just keep going. Chapter 9 Afterward was simple enough. Afterward didn't require any thought either. He picked himself up from the bomb blast, assured himself that nothing inside the cottage could have survived it, and began to head toward the edge of the creature's mouth. He cursed the would-be thieves from which he had taken the bomb for his deafness, what had they expected? To sell tiny pieces of him and themselves to the organ bank? Meerkats ran past him, intent on reaching the cottage. He ignored them, and they, in their concern and panic, ignored him. He didn't even bother showing them his badge. At the docks, he found a sailbird loitering in the water nearby and swam out to it. It began to glide away from the Leviathan at a good rate of speed. As the Leviathan faded into the distance, it faded from his mind as well. Of more immediate concern was the moodiness of the sailbird, which, after several false alarms, finally decided to submerge itself. It left Shadrach floundering about in his trench coat, with the shore only barely visible on the horizon. For a few anxious minutes, he thought he would drown because of his coat. Thrashing as he tried to get it off, he floated several feet below the surface. But, kicking off his shoes and contorting his arms, he managed to rid himself of the coat and pop, breathless, to the surface. Luckily, any current was minimal and he was a good swimmer. Eventually, he felt land beneath his feet. He rose from the water, sodden and dripping, a sudden ghost, an echo, a shadow of who he had been. He imagined no one could see him. Who would want to see him? The shore had become a graveyard for the abandoned cathedral crafts of the meerkats. Black and incomprehensible and toppled over on their sides, he shot the two flesh dogs he saw sniffing around the cathedrals before they even saw him. He was not sorry at all for such premeditated violence. Rather, he slaughter every living thing in his path than never see the light again. He used his gun to char one of the flesh dogs on a spit, and he ate some of the meat. After he had eaten, he stood up and looked around. He was alone for the first time since he had picked up John the Baptist. The absence of the meerkat on his arm made him feel as if he were missing a limb. There was no one to help him. There was no easy way to get back to the surface. There might be no way at all. But this did not deter him. His mouth was dry. He felt hollow. He felt as if he were dead. He decided that this was a good way to feel, after all of the hate, all of the love that had passed through him. He wanted to be empty for a while. Above him, the red light from the passing train mocked him with its thin, forced smile of motion. He would have to reach the tracks and find a way out. 
it did not strike him as an impossible task. He began to climb. Boulders and outcroppings of rock barred his way. Giant purple lichen covered the rock. Tiny, stunted trees grew between there. Strange creatures slurped and wetly plopped over the rocks, their cilia gliding in synchronized motion to serve as their eyes. They startled Shadrach, but ignored him, and after a time, he forgot about them. The rhythms of the climb became automatic, the blistering of his hands, a dull throb, the mechanics of his breathing as he gulped the air harsh but irrelevant. His physical body was no longer his concern. By the time he at last reached Rafter's door, Shadrach had passed through exhaustion into some other realm entirely. His arms were cut, his back still burned, his left ear bled from a bullet wound, his legs had been bruised from the punishing climbs. He shivered like Lady Ellington's fine crystal wrung with a spoon. Once on the train tracks, it had proven just as difficult to walk to the train station, the train barreling by with alarming frequency, Shadrach reduced to molding himself into alcoves on either side to avoid being killed, shivering with the aftermath of the train's tumultuous passage. News of Quinn's death had not made it to the train station, or had bypassed it entirely, and everything seemed as normal as before. At the train station, he had waited for a few hours, recovering his strength, using his Quinn badge to bully a cube of food out of a vendor. The hideous figures that walked past him as he ate, these seemed as normal as anything he had seen above ground. He had almost choked with laughter. What he took for granted now was beyond anyone's expectations. When he felt strong enough, he had continued to make his way, level by level, to Rafter's offices. The entire time, he could feel the light above him like an irresistible force, and below the light, standing in its rays, Nicola. Or so he hoped. He hadn't bothered to conceal his gun, holding it out in front of him instead, but even when he had used his gun, there was at the heart of him only someone who wanted desperately to reach the light. Gonna take a short break. Okay. He knocked on Rafter's door. A hesitation, and then the door opened and Rafter stood there. She stared at him with a mixture of horror and awe. Is she... is she still here? He asked. Rafter frowned. You're just in time to ruin her life again. She's conscious and walking. Walking? Yes, Rafter said. Come in. Rafter led him into her waiting room. Nicola sat on a couch. Her face was haggard. She stared at the floor. Her legs were ghoulish white, but intact. Her hair fell in straggles across her face. Rafter had dressed her in black pants and a plain white shirt. She looked like a person newly born. Shadrach tottered, almost fell, but managed to sit down beside her. For him, that moment would define the rest of his life. He let his gaze linger. He drank her in. He stared at that which he had never thought to see again. Rafter left them alone together, the look on her face unreadable. You look terrible, Nicola said in a raw voice. Are you okay? He fumbled for her hand, took it in his. She felt warm to his touch, and her warmth invaded him. He didn't feel capable of speech. His sentences all unraveled and incomplete. Rafter says, Nicola rasped, then coughed, and started again. Rafter says, you've seen into me. You've read my mind. You've been me. Didn't you feel me there? He thought. Was I no comfort to you? But all he said was, I thought it was necessary to protect you. What did you see there? She stared into his eyes. Beauty, courage, intelligence. 
She looked away. And ugly things, too. I'm sure. Shadrach shrugged. No, not really. But you saw, Shadrach. You saw. You know. Shadrach nodded. I know. Pain, yet that bittersweet relief in acknowledging it. I'm sorry, Shadrach. I'm sorry if I've hurt you. Rafter says you've saved my life. Rafter says I would have died without you. She exaggerates, Shadrach said. He had a sudden flash of seeing her again, buried within a mountain of limbs, and shuddered. How do you feel? Nicola blinked twice, closed her eyes. I feel very tired. I ache all over. I'm thirsty all the time. Can you walk? Yes. Then we should walk. We need to get to the surface. We need to get you into a hospital. I can try, she said. They stood up. Nicola almost fell. Shadrach grabbed her shoulders with both hands. They swayed there, together. Careful, he said. She hugged him. Her hair still smelled of the organ bank. Don't leave me, she said. Shadrach laughed bitterly. I won't. Don't worry, I won't. Rafter had returned, stood by the door. She glared at Shadrach, said, You must be careful. She'll be disoriented for a while. She may not make sense. She'll be weak. She'll need care. Afterwards, she'll be close to herself again. Nicola said, Nothing will ever be the same. It will be completely different, Shadrach said. That's not a bad thing. Got a chapter break here. An opportunity for me to sip some beer. Okay. <laughs> After Shadrach had paid for Rafter's work and Nicola had said her goodbyes, they began to walk toward the terminus for the next level. Rafter had given them a map, nothing so beautiful as a Quinn map, just scribbled lines and words on a scrap of paper. Only a few minutes into their journey, Nicola said, I'm tired, so tired, and staggered against the wall. Sleep then, Nicola, Shadrach said. He lifted her off her feet and began to carry her. When they were safely in an elevator that would take them to a higher level, her breath on his shoulder, soft and even, he allowed himself to relax a little. It began to seem that they would make it. Later, as they continued their slow progress upward... Oh my god, I just lost my spot. That never happens. Um, here we go. Sorry, everyone. Everyone being, like, two people. <laughs> Uh, later, as they continued their slow progress upward, she woke, her breath shallow, her grip on his shoulder sharper. Thank you, she said dreamily as she got to her feet. The second level beckoned from beyond the elevator. Here, people didn't flinch away from them. Stores were open. Women walked with their children. The pale light did not hide monstrosities. It seemed that the real city... The city of sun and horizon must be close by. Thank you for what, he said. For saving my life. I didn't have a choice. I don't believe that, Shadrach. But it's true. I love you, he said, hopelessly, the back of his throat sore. I know you do, she said. And then, Nicholas is dead. Yes, and Salvador, and Quinn. They're all dead. I knew my brother was dead, she said. I couldn't sense him anymore. She shuddered while Shadrach held her close, still amazed by her presence there in his arms. Even after she had woken up, Shadrach supported her weight at first, held her up, let her lean on him. From the second level, they still had to walk to the disembarkation point, which was really a... Sorry, everyone. I did it again. Still had to walk to the disembarkation point, which was really above the city, 
rising out of the city's wall so that those who came through would get a full view of Venus. They would have to hope the guards along the way would honor Shadrach's badge. As she grew stronger, he grew weaker. After they had successfully passed the next checkpoint and neared the ramp leading to the surface, he began to feel faint. He leaned on her, and she held him up. She stroked his hair. It's okay, she said. It's okay. The final checkpoint before the ramp consisted of a dull gray wall of some hard metal. Embedded in the wall was a guard, protected by three layers of glass. The guard, they could see even from far away, was a meerkat. Chadrak stiffened, reached into his pocket for his gun, even as he readied his badge and identification card. His alarm proved unfounded. What had looked menacing from a distance was less so in the flesh. Fur, mangy, a lost look on its face, its voice low and dull. It waved them through with just the slightest of glances at the badge. The stiff metal doors released, a space opened in front of them. Chadrak could smell fresh air coming from the darkness ahead. They walked through and stood on the ramp. Behind them, the wall became solid again. As they struggled up through the shadows of the ramp, some part of Shadrach still doubted they would reach the outside world. He thought he heard the sound of something at his back, stalking them. Don't look back, he whispered to Nicola, as she now leaned on him again. Don't look back. Their steps were so slow, weighted down with a terrible anticipation. The steep ramp seemed to have no end. Shadrach imagined he could see bits of glowing graffiti on the walls to either side. A child in the dark, a kiss in the dark, remakes the world in his own image, the weave and warp of flesh. But when he blinked, rubbed his eyes, the walls were bare. Shadrach's thoughts became wide and deep, walking upward, even if only it seemed from one darkness to another, reminded him of when he had first come above level, the first time he had seen Nicola. The look on her face in that moment, had it been happy, sad, reserved? He tried to remember, even as he seemed to hear more footsteps behind them. Perhaps it was wistful, or melancholy, or a bland smile that indicated a blank attention to duty. As Shadrach had emerged from below level, from the darkness of which a lack of love was only a part, he had wanted only the light, not love. Nor did he allow people to stand for symbols. How could he, living in a darkness where people were often just a touch, a scent, a voice? Abstract symbols could never comfort him in his despair, in the aching of his body for something better. His loves before Nicola had sometimes just been a voice and a grey-tinged body in the dusk of before death that comprised the hovels and split levels of the poor. And everyone below had been poor. Perhaps, he thought, as tiny lights broke the darkness of the ramp ahead of them, it had been the sadness on her face. How much in common would he have had with a woman whose life also appeared to be a tragedy? No, it was not sadness that drew him to her. He'd known more sad and ruined people in the mines than he cared to remember. He had known love as a voice and touch, surely, but also a desperate coupling in the dark for a moment of release, of freedom from below level. A rare thing. A precious thing. It could transport you out of time so that the world no longer had any hold on you. A hint of fresh air. Nicola's body leaning against his. So perhaps he had believed in symbols after all. Perhaps the frame of light as he ascended that first time drew him to her as it touched her body. Blind moth, the blinding flame. And maybe it was just this. When he came up into the light, the light shone upon her and she was not perfect. She had a face a trifle too narrow, a dull red birthmark between her thumb and forefinger, hair framing her face in tangled black strands. Such perfect imperfection, and he fell into her eyes because now, and only now, could he believe in this new world into which he had been reborn. It was populated with imperfect, beautifully imperfect strangers, and how it had broken his heart that first time, to know that after so much darkness, the light could be so real, so alive. Not perfect, but real, 
all of it, the world, the woman, his life. He felt the wind on his face and heard Nicola say, it's the stars, and realized that she too had not known until that moment that they were looking out at the night sky, slowly working its way toward dawn. He had not seen the sky for so long that the stars were each and every one a revelation to him, a new way of seeing the world, like the first time. They stood at the top of the ramp, which overlooked the city. It glistened with lights. It's beautiful, he said. A deadly, he thought. The city was a strange, hidden place with a white bridge and a gravel path. The city was a place of intermingled species, of minds. Was this evolution? He recalled the intricate beauty of the caterpillar map. He recalled John the Baptist's stoicism. Down below, he could see the thick, cool aqueducts of the canal district, the sides of the canals lined with lights. The world was silent. It seemed to him that the silence hid and would forever hide a living, breathing mystery. No matter what the city would, pardon, no matter that the city would eventually build a protective skin over this riddle so that it would be but the dim red of a beating heart seen through milky tissue. No matter that, if Nicholas was right, the city was filled with a thousand unturned keys ready in the lock, always just a gesture, a color, a sound away from clicking into place. The particular hue of a chemical sunset, the guttural command of a private policeman, the farewell kiss of lovers on a canal-side beach. Of all the signs and symbols in such a chaotic city, which would be the one to unleash Quinn's circus upon the world? Or would they stand forever at the ready, awaiting a command from a ghostly hand? Ahead of them, stairs led down into the Venus. Behind them, Shadrach heard the footsteps, the rustling getting louder. What had come up with them from below level? He pulled Nicola behind him, whirled around, hand on his gun, and saw nothing. No one was standing in the mouth of the ramp, just shadows. A kiss in the dark, he had imagined it, the man living in the belly of a giant fish. The real and the unreal had finally traded places. Then and only then did he allow himself to cry. Silent tears that ran down his face, dripped off his chin, fell to the pavement. He wept for the pain of his ordeal and for what he had to do to rescue Nicola. He wept for his parents, who surely must be dead, and for Nicholas, stupid, a fool, led astray and discarded. He wept for his former self, now that he had changed in so many ways and could not yet comprehend the half of them. But most of all, he wept with relief that Nicola was alive and that he was alive with her. But even though he hurt, and even though it was such sorrow to look upon Nicola's bruised face, and even though most things would not, as Nicola had said, ever again be the same, it was joy, not pain, that finally buckled his knees and brought him to the end of his endurance. He lay down against the rough stone of the ramp, staring up at the stars, wordless. Nicola sat beside him, together, but alone, her hand in his as she looked out over Venus. At dawn... He knew that they would walk down into the city, not sure what they would find there, but knowing it must be better than what they had left behind. He knew that memory would make the past easy by blurring the details and by distorting time. He would grow old to this. He would become sentimental. He would forget he had become a murderer. He would forget many things, but he would never forget that he loved her, despite that niggling thought which he would never be free of. Had he done enough... Could he have done better? Still fighting it, still not sure, Shadrach closed his eyes and slept for the first time in seven days. All right, everybody. That's the end. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I really recommend Jeff Vandermeer. If you enjoyed this book at all, I, it's one of his earlier works. Um, 
and it is good. Uh, and his writing only gets better. <laughs> um, let me actually see when this one was published. Looks like 2003, maybe. Anyway, I'd really recommend reading um, um, Born by him, as well as the Area X trilogy. That's where Annihilation comes from, if you've seen the film. Um, they're both exquisite, and I can't even begin to describe the sort of weird eco-fiction that they encompass. Uh, so yeah, take a look into Jeff Vandermeer. He's a killer author, um, you know, uh, an excellent voice for, uh, you know, eco-preservation among writers and among fans of fiction and the weird. And yeah, I'll probably be back tomorrow evening. I'm not sure what I'll be reading yet, so it'll be a surprise to me as well. But uh, yeah, please tune in tomorrow sometime like 7.30, I think. I don't know. I got to check my schedule. But uh, yeah, I'll be there. And uh, thanks for hanging. I'll see you next time.